Yeah, this is closer. How's everyone doing? Awesome, it's a full house. So, um, I had a whole presentation lined up, and then I was told this was interactive, so I'm gonna kind of ask this. I told them you guys like to ask questions, so ask away. Uh, the title of what I was gonna talk about, and what I'm gonna talk about is Ampere Speed to Market, right? How to master velocity and productivity. So what does that mean? That can mean all sorts of things, right? Uh, when, I, when I wrote this title, I was like, what, what do I really mean? Um, so I'm a developer by trade, as Michael mentioned, and I advise and consult a lot of startups, both in my day job at labs, um, but also on the side. Although I just had a kid, so these days, most of the time, I think I'm advising my baby more than anything and trying to get some sleep. Um, but regardless, usually when I have a conversation with a startup about this, it goes something like this. Um, hey, Terry. We don't have a whole lot of time. We, we need to go really fast. We need to go as fast as we can to market with our product, right? We need, how do we build and ship this thing as fast as possible? And my first reaction, which, you know, I work for a bigger company now, I've, I've done startups before, so maybe I'm a little out of touch, maybe not, is, well, why are you in such a rush? <laughs> right, there's, there's, why are you in such a rush? Um, what, what's, what's causing you to, to feel this pressure? And so I guess that's the first question, because we have a lot of entrepreneurs here, right? Um, what, what are your constraints that are causing you to want to go so fast, right? Want to go as fast as you can. Anybody have any? Yeah. The market itself is pretty fast, so you want to pay up with Okay. Anybody else? Competitors in your business, right? Anyone else? Okay, those are two good, two good things. Um, Fail fast. Fail fast, yes. And the thing that a lot that I'm actually surprised nobody mentioned here, maybe it's not much of an issue anymore, is, is run rate, right? When I was doing startups, um, and when I work with startups, um, usually the startups have a finite run rate. So at some point you run out of money, and you usually want to ship something. You want to ship as many times as possible before you run out of money, if not just um, at least once, right? So conversation he goes, Terry, we want to go as fast as possible. Well, Mr. Startup, why? It's for the reasons you, you all mentioned. Sometimes there's a deadline and a milestone associated with maybe a demo or a trade show or, or something in the market. And, and then there's a second part of that, right? Which is, and we're not going as fast as we, we need to be, right? Which means we're behind the curve on this. And that's what a lot of startups also tell me. Um, the reason they're asking me about going faster and shipping sooner is because they don't feel like they're doing it fast enough. Uh, so that's another question is, is um, why don't you all feel like you're going fast enough, right? What, what's slowing you down, maybe is the question. Resources. Resources, okay, that's a good one, yeah. And, and why? why, why, why are resources important? Well, if you're like, you know, like me, I'm a single person trying to start a business, I'm not building. Uh-huh. It costs me more than 24 hours. Right. Resources become an issue. Right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Got it. Okay. What else? Okay, so you, you two highlighted some good things, and I'm going to actually take a whole step back from that and say that it actually all starts with, ooh, what did I do? All right, it all starts with users. <laughs> right? Users are the lifeblood of any bootstrapped company. And um, I don't like that back. <laughs> and the ultimate validation that your business is doing well, right, is that you have users engaged in using your product. And so, how do you get more users, right, is the question you ask, right? Resources, right? How do you, how do you even get your first user? And if you're a product-minded person like me, you say features, right? You gotta build features, lots of features. Um, we get more features, we get more users. So I'm gonna use an antidote for a startup I help start early stage. Um, we had one persona for a year that we started out with, a mid 20 something young working professional living in the Bay Area who's very tech savvy. Very unique persona, I know. And this person has a problem. He's single, he has a problem. No, this startup is not Tinder or anything like that. Um, he comes home from work and he's bored out of his mind. He doesn't know what's going on in the city. So hey, wouldn't it be great to have a place to go to to look at all the events going around your area, right? And currently this information is distributed amongst a lot of different local sources. It's hard to actually get it. 
So hey, why don't we build an app that aggregates all of that? And that was our idea. So we did what any reasonable startup would do, and we built a pitch deck, right, to get feedback around idea and shop it around. And we started meeting with lots of investors, lots of um, friends and family, really anybody who would listen to us to get feedback on the idea. So we started these series of meetings. The first meeting went, okay, that's great, but you need to social proof this, right? There's a lot of noise in these listings. So okay, we need more features now, right? We need Facebook integration to add friends. We need accounts. We need them to like this stuff. So we have some sort of stack ranking around what's important and what's not. And that's after the first meeting. Second meeting was a little bit of a downer. It was with a potential investor, and they said, hey, um, bad news, your idea is not so unique after all. We were totally shocked by this, believe it or not. Um, there are like five other startups that are doing this, and two of them are in my portfolio. So you really should differentiate. What if you go outside of the Bay Area? OK, so let's use the same persona in New York and in LA to do the same thing. Well, SF Guardian isn't going to do somebody in New York very good, so now we need to add a more generic source. So why don't we get events from Twitter? Right? People tweet about events all the time. Let's do some natural language, some fancy techie data science stuff, natural language processing, k-means clustering to get events intelligent out of Twitter. And we can do this anywhere in the world. Now we have three personas. And the next persona um, was random. It's somebody said, well, what about stay-at-home parents? I can resonate with this now. Um, they're taking care of their kids all the time. They're probably not going to go out at night afterwards, unless you're me, maybe. Um, so, so they're not going to be interested in events, but they're interested in news. So OK, let's get them news. More features, right? And then next, next, next meeting, and we haven't actually built anything at this point, right? We've just been revising our pitch deck like any disciplined entrepreneur does and shopping this around and getting feedback. Somebody was like, well, everybody wants the news, right? So now our persona is everyone. And the Kansas City Star is not going to do everyone any good. So let's add some help, right? Maybe Nextdoor, maybe Patch, which sources local news globally, could help. And now we've got lots of users. Our persona is everybody. And our features are a lot, right? And this is why, going back to your point, right, you want more resources, right? Because you've got a lot of features to build. Very little time to do it because you have a lot of features to build and you want more resources. Can anybody resonate with this at all? <laughs> okay, so I'm not crazy. Um, how do you all feel about this? Maybe that's a very generic question. Is it overwhelming? Yeah, so what do you do, right? You have to do more. So you have to build these features. So you get your development guy. Maybe it's like me. Oops. Oh, and everybody likes photos too. So because the persona is everyone, obviously everyone likes pictures. So we're going to add pictures. <laughs> Pictures make everything better. So the developers me, you start one person coding away. Um, they're probably going pretty fast because they're one person. But they can only do one thing at a time. So it wouldn't be great to have another developer do two things at a time. Um, so now we're going twice as fast. That's awesome, right? So let's keep going. Let's add two more developers to your team. At some point, you're probably going to reach a funding cap with this. But you could kind of keep going, right? Maybe have a team of six, offer some equity. Maybe you meet another startup that's a kindred spirit and like-minded. So now you have 10 developers, right? And your original grab bag of features for every user on the planet, actually really the continental US from what I, what I just said, um, is now going to take a tenth of the time, right? So if originally you thought this was going to take eight months to build, now it takes a tenth. Now it's really only like three weeks. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? It doesn't really work like this, right? So I was going to tell you that what happened was great. With my startup, this is exactly what happened. Three weeks later, you know, we shipped. A million users came online day two. And then we IPO'd and lived happily ever after in overpriced housing in the Bay Area at the end. <laughs> um, no, not true. So why doesn't this work? What do you all think? Communication. Communication. Yep. What else? The mythical mammoth, yes. The mythical mammoth, which is indeed mythical, right? Right, these things all have to come together, right? And, and I think all these answers are sort of in the same position, which is all of this stuff, right? The product, the features, the code, it all has to become one. And that's actually really, really hard. Right? I think over time, I feel like I'm pretty good at estimating how long it'll take to get through any one of these individual streams. 
Historically, I'm dead wrong usually about how long that question mark piece takes. And, and it's almost impossible in my experience to predict. It's, and with the startups I, I talk to, it's the same thing. It's, I think maybe I give it two, three weeks. Sometimes it takes two to three or six to eight months, sometimes over a year. It's impossible to predict. So going back to the communication point, right? That's an important point. As you grow your team, um, you start with one person. They can go pretty fast. They don't have to talk to anybody. All the code, maybe all the product is in their head. Um, then you add another person. Still not that bad, right? It's two people. They're working in the same space, or they're on a Slack channel or something. Communication's pretty easy, but something happens, right? Which is these two people are now working on the same, on diff two different things, but they have to stay on the same page, right? So now there's a line of communication, a, a continuous conversation is what I like to call it that needs to happen, right? Um, but it can still be pretty organic. You add three, now this is three, now you're talking about interrupting people, right? Because if one person wants to get on the same page with the other two, you've got to stop everybody. This is called a meeting. You add four, it's six. What just happened there? Um, I know, I'm stating the obvious half the time. Four, it's six. Um, we added one more person, but we actually doubled the number of lines of communication we needed. Five, it's 11, I think it's 10, actually. And six is 21. So with every person you add to a team, um, the number of conversations you have to maintain to keep everyone on the same page grows up exponentially, right? And what does every product team usually do to solve this? What, what do we do to solve this? What have you done to solve this? Okay. Meetings. Smaller, smaller teams. Smaller teams, that's a good, yeah. So don't, don't, ha, don't, don't grow your team to six or 10 developers, right? Or six or 10 people. Yep, so, so we've done that, yep. So I have a little story about that, actually. So another startup I was a part of, I started as that one developer um, who was writing code in Android for a startup. And I wasn't going fast enough because within a few days, they threw on somebody else. <laughs> and at some point, my team got to be as big as 20. And I think I was literally in meetings, probably, I was coding maybe less than 5% of the time. Um, I was literally in meetings probably for like 50, I'm not even exaggerating, something like 50 or 60 hours a week. And what's interesting <laughs> is, in those meetings, I would always get asked the same questions by, this, by the same stakeholders, right? How long is it gonna take to ship this feature? Well, it takes six months. Why does it take so long? Because stuff takes time to build and we have a big team that has to integrate. There's that big question mark. I'm not gonna tell you it takes three weeks because I've learned that lesson, it doesn't work. Okay. And then the next, the next question is always my favorite, um, which some people can relate to, some people can't, which is, if I could give you 40 outsourced developers tomorrow in some foreign country, <laughs> could you do it in 1 40th of the time? <laughs> the answer is no, right? And all my meetings, I think for a year, were talking to different people, asking the same question in different ways because they couldn't take no for an answer, right? It's, it's, well, what if it's a different foreign country? Or, or what if it's 35 developers? And, and how many developers can it really be? All, all this time wasted just trying to basically cut corners and ship faster. Um, the funny thing is, half the time it was actually the same person in the same day in a different meeting asking the same questions rephrased differently. My CEO. That's another story. <laughs> so this doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So there's a theme here, right? Which is to go faster. What have we been doing? We've been trying to do more, right? We're trying to get more users. We're trying to add more features. We're, we now don't have a big enough team to support these features, to your point, right? Don't have such a big team. But we, need to, we, we feel like we need to build a bigger team to do that. And when that doesn't work and slows down, the first question we get asked from the business side is, what if we made your team even bigger than it is now? That'll make it even faster, right? And it's this vicious cycle. And, and so, Going faster is not so much, I think, about actually going faster, because I think if nothing's in your way, it's actually pretty easy to go fast. Um, it's about all the things that slow you down and all the complexities that come with doing more, actually. So what if we try something different? What if we try doing less instead? All right, so let's take back this example, right? We've got the six, con the six people. I, I scale it down to fit on the slide. Uh, six conversations. Okay, so let's do less. Let's have three. But you know, we don't want to fire half our team overnight, right? That wouldn't be very nice. So, maybe we would do it anyways, I don't know. 
So why don't we, if they're developers, right? Why don't we pair them up? Two developers to one computer. Now we have three streams, right? We're doing half as much. We're definitely doing less. Not really getting out of anything out of it yet, right? Um, this is actually a, a practice called pair programming, which is, I'm gonna call it either legendary or infamous, depending on your view of this. Um, it's, it's, it's part of some very specific flavors of Agile, like extreme programming. So let's do this, and then let's introduce one other thing. We have three streams now, right, that we have to integrate at the end of the day, based on our previous dialogue. Let's rotate people every day. So one person hangs on to the feature, and the next person rotates. So if you have a team of this size, every three days, if you have a feature greater than three days, the whole team is touching that work. So because you're doing that now, you only really need to maintain one stream of development. And if you have one stream like this, you can really ship at any time, right? Because it's just one line of work. So this is kind of interesting, right? We're doing less. That got us down from 21, like six streams of development down to three, so we're doing half as much. But really, when we only do three, we only really have to maintain one, one stream if we do something like pairing, for example. So the conversations, it's the same thing. Now you only really have three <laughs> conversations. So what have we found with this? So doing less takes a lot of discipline. You know, it's radical. It's definitely not a fit for everybody. Um, pairing is, is one idea of doing less. A lot of my friends who are developers didn't get into development because they wanted to sit and talk all day, right? They're, they're introverted, a lot of them are, not all of them. Um, they'd rather just go heads down and build. But our meetings get reduced to two to three hours a week. And devs spend more time devving. Developing. Yes? You still rotate. You rotate half that pair, right? So we, well, it's two people are working on one thing, right? Yes. It is because one person continues working on the feature. Half of the pair stays, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. We do it every day. Every day. By default, usually. I, I've seen it done every day. Sometimes I've done it twice a day, to be honest. Go ahead. Uh huh. Exactly. And that's part of the trade off, right? Is you lose, we're still only doing half the things, right? Is, is your point. And we've doubled, well, we're doing, we're, we're either doing the same things and doubling the costs or, or doing half the things, right? So, so you're totally right. So, so what about that, right? We've got, we, we're more predictable. That's the benefit, right? We don't have that giant question mark anymore that we have no idea how long it takes. I would actually argue that that's much better um, than being half as productive and having that giant question mark. Because typically, that giant question mark around integration, in my experience, takes way longer than double the cost. Um, it's oftentimes a factor of 10. Not necessarily, but what it does mean is if you keep doing that, every member will naturally become full stack, right? Because if you have somebody who knows one area and somebody who knows another, it all sort of starts to blend. Can you talk about continuous integration to go with it? Yes, so, so because you have that one stream, though, you, and, and we don't have time for that, but, but you're totally right. Because you have one stream, you can do the continuous integration. Uh-huh. So I just chose this as an example. I've actually done both. The difference for me is that they both work um, differently in different solutions and in different situations, right? So there are a lot of situations, I've been on teams, where the mobbing works a lot better than pairing, actually. So for example, if I'm the developer with all the context and I have three new people join my team, um, pairing two new people together sometimes doesn't always work out well if you have a team of only two pairs. So we end up mob programming to ramp everyone up for maybe the first week or two. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the advantages I've seen, because I'm a developer and I've worked you know, a lot with different agile teams, uh -huh. is you're not actually now shipping. And so you can get faster feedback from your, your users. Exactly, users. exactly. So you actually change direction and you're actually going in the right direction. Yep, so there's actually one more thing I wanted to mention. Ah, oh, dude, I did it again. Okay. <laughs> 
the one more thing I wanted to mention was all those features you saw. Sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, all those features that you saw in that graph of our startup, right? This goes to your question also about you've got half your productivity now or, or you're, you're doubling your costs. Think about how we got there too, right? If we apply the principle of doing less, do we really need to do all those features? Do we really need for the app persona to be everyone in the entire continental US? Probably not, right? So how about we just start with a couple of personas? And I think somebody mentioned this in the, in the audience, right? And a few of those features. We can ship faster, right, because we have one stream. And if you notice, one of the things that we did, maybe this was because it was the, the time period that we were doing this in, um, we didn't actually really ever talk to the real actual users, right? We talked to investors, we talked to our friends, we talked to people on the street. We didn't actually talk to the users we were targeting, right? We didn't talk to Oliver, the, the, uh, the young working professional. We didn't talk to the stay-at-home person and say, what are your needs? What do you want? And, and, and if you do that, and you build features based on that feedback, then you get feedback some more, and you analyze that, and you iterate without necessarily ballooning your persona list to the entire world. Maybe you don't need to do that giant, that giant grab bag of features that you needed to, to have that giant development team for. Right? It's, it's also a matter of doing less. And um, it turns out, actually, doing this sort of feedback cycle around user research and getting, there's some talks, I think, here today. Turns out, I found at least, that that's a whole skill in art in and of itself. So I wouldn't trust myself to do that as a developer, um, at least not on my own. Um, so it'd probably be good to, to have someone like a UX designer who's qualified to do that. Any other questions? Um, what I find is I'm currently overseeing a project right now at Labs. How many pairs is it? It's 12 pairs, 24 people. Um, and what we've done is we've actually broken it down into three groups of four pairs. Um, so I find that usually about four pairs is kind of when it starts to get a little bit crazy. Four, four to five pairs. And so at that point then, break it off into another team. But if you're doing if you're, if you're doing 12 pairs of development um, at any given point in time, you probably have a pretty big product. So you've got a whole other set of problems at that point, probably, as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. It would, but I would say that, so, so I don't think this precludes hiring well, right? Or finding the right people to do the right task, staffing a project in the right way. So if you start with that foundation, let's call it, let's say you hire, if you have an iOS problem, right? And you want to put a pair of programmers on it, let's call it. You probably want at least one of those people to be really well versed in iOS, if not both of them. Um, and then you can grow the team out that way. So I think if you start with that foundation, um, then it becomes not a question of, well, are there problems with cross-training? It becomes more like, this is the process for cross-training. Right? This is how people, people ramp up together. You, you do, you know, but I think, I would argue that if you're hiring correctly and you're hiring for aptitude, um, it's not that big of a jump even if you don't have the right expertise to get involved in the right expertise. One, one more question, guys. Last yeah. question. Go uh, ahead, You pick. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. you've been raising your hand for a while. <laughs> yes. So I've seen this work well with uh, product management um, and also both UX and visual design as well. In fact, actually, I'd say it works really, really well for design because I find that design is actually a a field that's actually harder to cross train, right? It takes years, if not decades, to get really, really good at visual design, for example. So pairing two designers together, one who's really good at UX research and, and one who's very good at visual, typically works really well. It's very hard to find someone who's actually good at both. Okay, great, thanks, right. Terry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.